Hello class, it is now time for our read aloud. We're currently reading A Week in the Woods by Andrew Clements. We are now on chapter 18. The title of chapter 18 is Bushwhacking. Mark was glad Anya had made him take his stocking cap. He'd been hiking on the loop trail for about half an hour. A stiff breeze had come up, making the brisk air feel much colder. He'd had to stop and fish the hat out of the zippered compartment on the top of his pack, and now his ears were warm again. The scrub oak trees on either side of the trail still held some of their dry leaves from the previous fall, and when the gusts swept up the hillside, the rustling sound reminded Mark of waves breaking along a beach. The bare branches of the maple and birch trees swayed and tapped against each other, and high overhead where the wind was stronger, the pine trees waved and sighed. Mark noticed from the start that this loop trail wasn't nearly as wide as the main trail had been. He had to keep a sharp lookout for the markers. The ones on this trail were blue, and there weren't as many of them. Sometimes they were almost hidden by tree branches. A few times, when the trail wasn't obvious, Mark searched until he found the next little blue circle, or the next splotch of faded blue paint on a rock. And it didn't help that in some places, the pine and hemlock trees were thick enough to dim the fading daylight. Mark tried not to think about it, but his pack had begun to feel heavier. A lot heavier. Mark knew he was getting tired. He knew he was slowing down some, too. But that's okay, he thought. I'm just going back to the campground, and even if it gets dark, I've got a flashlight. And the trail is mostly downhill, right? So Mark ignored his body's call for rest. He kept pushing ahead. As Mark walked out of a thick grove of birch and hemlock trees, the trail made a sharp turn to his right, angling up across a stretch of mostly open hillside. Only a few scruffy oaks and low junipers clung to the slope. The climb would be steep, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was that the trail wasn't really a trail anymore. It looked more like the rocky bed of an uphill river. Where the trail used to be, there was a crazy jumble of granite boulders, some of them as big as washing machines. To go up that way, Mark saw he'd have to pick out a path either above the gullied trail or just below it. Or, he thought, I could find a different way. Mark dug the map out of his pants pocket and unfolded it. He saw the sharp turns that the trail took on the map and thought, so that means I'm right here. The trail headed uphill for a stretch, then went left for half a mile along a ridge, and then the trail turned left once more and went almost straight downhill toward the campground. Mark looked uphill at the boulders. And then turning left to face the hemlock and birch grove, he thought, According to the map, if I just go straight that way, then in about half a mile I'll come to the trail again, the part that heads down to the campground. Then I won't have to fight my way uphill at all. It seemed simple to Mark, especially since he was tired and hungry and his legs and feet and shoulders were hurting. Then he thought, still, I'd better use my compass. So he took off his pack once more, pulled his compass out of the front pouch, and did some quick thinking. The map showed that the uphill part of the trail was heading north. Then, at the ridge, the trail made a left turn, which meant it would be heading roughly west. And since the trail turned left again to go downhill, that would mean it was running almost straight south. So from where I'm standing, Mark said to himself, I go west and that'll take me directly across to the downhill part of the trail. I get to the trail and turn left, which is south. Simple. With a groan, Mark heaved his pack up onto his back and fastened the buckles and straps. He looped the lanyard of his compass over his head. Then he opened the cover of the compass and turned the whole thing until the red end of the magnetic needle lined up with the N on the case. Then keeping the compass still and steady, Mark turned himself until north was to his right, and he was facing toward the letter W on the compass case, due west. And then Mark started walking. Working his way westward, Mark found that the going was a lot harder. It wasn't like walking on a trail. He had to duck under low branches, step over fallen limbs and trees, and push his way through tangled brush. His frame pack felt even heavier, and it kept getting caught on things as he worked his way forward. There were occasional rocky stretches where there was less brush, but picking his way among the rocks and outcroppings wasn't easy either. Mark had checked his compass every 30 steps or so. 
He had also taken care not to drift downhill to his left as he walked across the shoulder of the mountain. When large outcroppings or dense brush had pushed him off course, he had always adjusted for the detour and gotten himself going due west again, straight toward the trail that would lead him back to camp. And Mark had tried his best to count his steps and estimate his distance. He had done everything right. That's why, after 30 minutes of walking, Mark couldn't understand why he hadn't found the trail yet. After 45 minutes, he began to wonder if his compass was working properly. And after almost an hour, Mark thought maybe Mrs. Farr's map was wrong, so he stopped to look at it again. But it wasn't the map's fault, and Mark's compass wasn't to blame. It was the forest. The forest had tricked him. That, plus his own inexperience. A more experienced hiker would have known that a log laid across a trailhead means trail closed. If Mark had known that, then maybe he wouldn't have been looking for a trail that was wide and clear and worn away like the other one had been. And if Mark had known that the trail he was trying to find had been closed for three years, then he might have kept a more careful lookout for it, because three years is a long time in the forest. For the past three years, every tree and plant alongside the unused trail had stretched its branches out onto the open space, reaching for more light. First the ferns and the scrub oak and the blueberry bushes, then the evergreens and the hardwoods. And on the trail bed itself, the winged maple seeds and the pine cones and the acorns and the layers of roots have been hard at work, trying to reclaim their ground. The seedlings and the runners had sent their roots into the boot-softened soil to soak up the water that pooled on the path after every rain. Without the almost daily pounding of hiking boots, new plants and shoots had grown and flourished. And that's why, at the particular place where Mark had crossed the downhill leg of the loop trail, his eyes saw only more forest. After looking at Mrs. Farr's map and then looking at his watch again, Mark realized that somehow, somewhere, he must have missed the trail. So he made a good decision. He decided to backtrack. He turned himself around, checked his compass, and headed due east. As he walked, Mark thought back to Saturday, just two nights ago. He'd gone outside after dinner to mess around down by the little pond behind his house, and he'd watched the sunset at about 7.15. It had stayed light for quite a while after that. That's because on Saturday, the sky had been clear. Not today. Today the clouds were thick and dark. It was only quarter of seven, and the daylight was fading fast and it was also getting colder. Instinctively, Mark picked up his pace. He wanted to find the trail down to the campground before dark. Mark took 40 steps and stopped to check his compass. Another 40 steps, another compass check. It was when Mark stopped to check his compass the fifth time. From far ahead and uphill, sort of off to his left, he heard something. Mark. At first, he thought he had imagined it. Someone shouting? Mark stood still, pulled off his stocking cap, and held his breath. Mark! No mistake this time. Someone was calling his name, and Mark was sure of something else. That voice? That was Mr. Maxwell, yelling his name. Quick anger surged up in Mark's chest. To be tracked down and caught by Mr. Maxwell. To be led back to the campground. To be dragged off to the blue pickup truck and driven home to face suspension and all the rest of it. Mark turned and started running, blindly running, running anywhere, just away, away from that voice, away from that man. Mark! Rushing fiercely, rushing wildly, Mark pushed through the brush and charged downhill, jumping over logs and boulders. He slapped the low branches aside as he thrashed forward. Mark! Mark didn't realize how tired he was, but his body knew. He was asking too much of it, pushing too hard and too fast. The slope of the land pulled him forward, demanding split-second decisions. As he jumped down a four-foot drop, Mark expected his legs to absorb the shock of the landing. They refused. It wasn't a bad fall, but gravity and speed and the weight of the frame pack made it a hard one. Mark got his hands up in time to keep from smashing his face on the rocky ground, and he felt a chunk of rock bite into the heel of his left palm. Mark lay still sprawled and panting. Again came the call, or at least part of it. Ma! The voice was farther away now, above and behind. Mark only heard half his name. 
It sounded as if someone had hung up a phone in the middle of a word. Lying there in the ground, his heart pounding and his injured hand throbbing, Mark had a moment of clarity. His anger and fear were gone, spent. It was as if he was looking down on himself and Mr. Maxwell and the mountain and the campground. The whole scene snapped into focus and Mark thought, Why am I running away from him? I was already headed back to the campground, right? So I was going to have to face up to Mr. Maxwell anyway. It might as well be now. I'll just go and find him. Turn myself in. Might even make things easier to do it now instead of later. Mark struggled to right himself, wincing as he tried to push with his left hand. Sitting up, he took a look at it. There was a small cut on the fleshy part of his palm, just below the thumb joint. Not much blood, mostly a deep bruise from the force of the fall. His right hand hurt too, but it hadn't been cut. On his feet again, Mark turned to face uphill. He took a deep breath, cupped his hands around this mouth, and yelled, I'm down here! Ten seconds passed, then twenty. Mark called again, Hey, I'm down here! He waited again, straining to hear, trying to filter out the sound of the wind among the trees. Nothing. Mr. Maxwell? I'm down here! Pulling in a deep breath, Mark put all his strength into one more yell. Mr. Maxwell! No reply. Only the wind and the shushing pines in his own deep breaths, now making plumes of vapor in the cold mountain air. Then Mark remembered. Mr. Survival! The whistle! Snatching at the straps and buckles, Mark ripped his pack off and in 15 seconds had rummaged through the front pockets until he found the little silver coach's whistle that he'd bought at Walmart, an Acme Thunderer. The black lanyard was still rolled up and fastened with a rubber band, just the way it had come out of its package. Mark put the mouthpiece between his lips, sucked in a breath through his nose, and pushed a blast of air through the whistle. The sharp burst of sound left Mark's ears ringing, and even in the wind he could hear it echo off the ridge high above. Mark strained his ears to hear an answering call. Nothing. He blew it again and stood still to listen. And again, nothing. Mark thought, maybe Mr. Maxwell was going uphill while I was running down. Maybe he's gone over a ridge up there or doubled back toward the main trail. Or maybe the wind in the trees soaked up the sound of my voice. He just didn't hear me call. And now maybe he can hear the whistle, but I can't hear him calling back. That's got to be it. And if he's too far away, then there's only one thing to do. I've got to go up there. Mark unrolled the lanyard and hung the whistle around his neck. He was about to lift the pack onto his back and get going, when he remembered something. Digging into another pocket, he pulled out an energy bar unwrapped it, and forced himself to sit down and eat the whole thing, and then to take a small drink of water. Mark hated the delay, but he knew he was tired, and now he'd have to walk uphill again. He needed the fuel. Swinging the pack around to his back, he buckled it in place, settled the straps on his shoulders, turned his mind away from the pain of his hand, and set off up the hill, hurrying toward the place where he'd last heard Mr. Maxwell's voice. He was in such a hurry that for the first time all afternoon, Mark forgot to do something, something important. He forgot to check his compass. All right, I hope you like chapter 18. We'll see you later.